I'm Dr. Uh, Michelle Villagran, and want to welcome you to our third webinar from the Your Voices uh, Project. And just want to give about a minute about around what Your Voices is, and we will put the link to our blog in the chat for you. So Your Voices, it's a one-year project uh, that we've been working on around fostering conversations, dialogue, uh, soliciting input from students within our college, School of Information Applied Data Science, around diversity, equity, inclusion, and I would even expand that to belonging. And really with a focus centered around your voices, you as students, and your experiences that we value, appreciate, and want to hear. So your voices, learning, listening, and sharing encompasses uh, four webinars. This is our third one. Uh, the e-newsletter, as well as community learning spaces. And uh, thank you, Kara has shared the um, blog link so you can learn more about our project there at your leisure. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my assistant, Kara, to introduce the program today. Hello, everyone. I would like to introduce to you three members of the Central Coast Queer Archive Project, also abbreviated as CCQAP. Um, so we have three amazing people joining us, Stephen Rosinski, David uh, Weisman, and Rowan Waters. So um, for a little bit of background before I give it away, uh, move it on over to, to Stephen. Um, the Central Coast Queer Archive Project is a collaborative community-based effort that is tasked with documenting the history of queer and trans lives on the California Central Coast. The project values the specificity of individual lives, and so they mean the terms queer and trans to encompass not only the recognized range of historically marginalized LGBTQ plus identities, but also the lives of those that do not readily fit into intelligible categories of gender and sexuality. So I don't want to give away too much, so I will hand it over to Stephen. Um, and once again, thank you so much for um, being here this evening to, to share a little bit more about the project, um, the reason why you decided to take on this project and what it means to you, along with what it means to those um, who have experiences, who have these experiences, and what it means to be able to preserve those experiences. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. But th well, thank you, Kara, and thank you, Michelle, for inviting us and allowing us to kind of talk about our project. And we're very excited to work with uh, and, and, you know, just chat about our work with um, all of you um, wonderful people coming from, looks like a lot of people in California, but lots of people from elsewhere too. So uh, welcome. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Steven Rosiski, and I am an, a um, professor of uh, English and Women's Gender and Queer Studies at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Um, and I, I have a little dog, and sometimes he is very quiet, but sometimes he makes some noise. So you may hear a little doc, dog noise. Um, he just like, yawned, yawned very loudly. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and um, so I'm I'm a part of the CCQAP. I think maybe what we can do, uh, David and Rowan, is just do kind of quick introductions for ourselves. Um, I say a little bit about our, ourselves, and then I'll spend some time talking about just how the project got started. And then uh, Rowan and David, you can talk maybe about how you got involved, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of uh, work through the background from there. Um, so, uh, David, do you want to do your intro? Okay, yeah, David David Weissman. I'm coming to you from Morro Bay, California at the moment, though um, I'm originally from uh, New York City. And um, my background was, is, was as a filmmaker. I went to the New York University Film School in the 1980s and did mostly documentary work. And then I moved to California to be in show business. I still ended up in documentary work, and the big thing I did in L.A. was a 28-part series on the environment for PBS in the late mid, mid and late 90s. And then I eventually came up to uh, Morro Bay and found myself involved in uh, anti-nuclear activism, which is where I was most of today involved with as a consumer advocate. But occasionally I like to pick up a camera, and when paths crossed and the opportunity here, oh, I forgot, yeah. In between, I spent eight years doing an oral history project. I forgot about that for the Conservation History uh, Association of Texas, which comes from the School of Library and Information Sciences at the University of Texas in Austin. 
And so that was kind of the nexus of the two interests uh, coming together here. Rowan. And I am uh, Rowan Waters. I work in the office at the San Luis Obispo Museum of Art. Um, I come originally from Ramona, California, which is down in San Diego County. Um, I'm more, I'm on the student side of things. I'm kind of learning how to do um, oral history projects. And it's been an amazing experience so far to kind of learn how to do oral histories and how to do camera work and all of these amazing new things. So. Cool. Thank you. So I just to get talk a little bit about how the project got started. So I completed my, my graduate work in uh, uh, English literature, uh, my PhD at the University of Buffalo, New York. Uh, I originally grew up in California, but I did my graduate work uh, uh, back east. And I uh, moved back to San Luis Obispo for work. Um, uh, I had a, a, a lectureship at Cal Poly. Um, now, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Buffalo, New York, but it's actually a really nice uh, size city. It's a kind of a midsize. I miss, I actually like Buffalo a lot. It's a, a midsize city. It's a city that can sustain, uh, has enough of a, of a gay kind of queer population community that it can sustain something like five gay bars. Uh, each one is a little bit different. Um, they have a pretty robust um, uh, pride celebration that was actually really starting to get really interesting and big by the time I had to move, move back to California. Um, oh yeah, so yeah, some people are familiar with Buffalo. That's great. Uh, Rochester, wonderful. Um, so, uh, but then I moved back to San Luis Obispo. San Luis Obispo is a small city. It's maybe uh, San Luis Obispo itself is 45,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, and so to go from Buffalo, which had a, a, a kind of built in queer community there to a city that felt like it didn't really have anything, it started raising questions for me. Uh, and so I thought it, it can't be that there aren't queer people here or trans people here. So where where are they, right? What is that story? Uh, and so it became largely a selfish pro selfish project of just wanting to learn about the place that I had arrived at. Uh, and so, you know, the project went through multiple iterations. Uh, I think Rowan, you were kind of a part of it at the very start when we met in a a bar that doesn't exist anymore and a kind of down, it wasn't a gay bar, it was just a bar space that we met with a couple of other people who were kind of interested in doing some kind of community organizing work. Um, and so one of the ideas that we came up with was a group of people to was just start doing research to see what we could find. Um, and so we started there and we, we made a number of different partnerships, one of them being with the, and I think this is like 2000, 15 or 16 when, when this is kind of just getting off the ground. So we contacted, uh, we had a contact at the Slow Historical Society, uh, which is this other little building in downtown San Luis Obispo, uh, as maybe partners to start working on this project. And one of our other collaborators, uh, Zach McKiernan, who's a professor of history, public history at Cuesta College, the local community college in the area, so that's where we kind of connected uh, with him. And then I think, David, that's how you kind of came on at that point, right? Um, it was, well, it bases on the politics of San Luis, which of course becomes a subject. Summer of 2018, there was a pride festival in San Luis. There was a pride flag hanging above the aforementioned museum, uh, San Luis Historical Society you mentioned, and it was vandalized. I had just gotten back from a trip to Mexico. I opened the newspaper and there's a story about the pride flag being vandalized at the History Center. And then subparagraph buried down it is, well, the History Center was busy at work on an oral history project about queer lives in, in San Luis. And I'm like, well, I just did this like eight year oral history project in uh, Texas. Gosh, maybe I should go meet these folks. And I think that's how that happened. Yeah. And so we connected there um, and then uh, just started kind of talking and collaborating on our, our you know, what, what we might do. We had lots of different meetings and we went through multiple iterations and met in a lot of different places. Um, eventually, I think about 2019, I, uh, there's a program here at Cal Poly that's called the Beach Beacon Mentorship Program. Uh, and it's about providing mentors for uh, students from underserved populations at, at Cal Poly to kind of give them a research experience. So I started working with this young woman named Autumn Ford, uh, who 
um, was very interested in doing kind of an oral history project, kind of helping out with this investigation. Uh, and so in, in collaboration with David and Rowan uh, and Autumn, um, we came up with the project of trying to, we had learned that there was, there had been a gay bar in San Luis Obispo. We heard rumors about it. We heard, we heard bits and pieces and things, uh, but we couldn't quite figure out what the story was. And so Autumn uh, did the, a lot of the footwork in actually tracking down Lisa Dean, who was, uh, she wasn't initially an owner, but she was uh, kind of brought on as an employee at the bar and then uh, began to work there as a uh, manager. And then I think she became a part owner at, at, towards the end. Um, and so uh, Autumn, uh, found that Lisa was working, works at like a local tax firm and kind of emailed Lisa at her uh, work email address. And Lisa said, yes, I am the Lisa Dean that, you know, worked at Breezes, but this is my work email. Don't contact me here. Here's the, my right email that you can contact me at. So we finally figured out how to talk to Lisa Dean and uh, managed to do our first, basically our first interview, which was the Lisa Dean interview in which she, she kind of gave us the history of the bar, which is fascinating. Um, and maybe this is a good time, um, David, to talk about, show that clip with the Lisa Dean interview. Do you, do you want to cue that up and, and let that go? You're muted, David. Got it. The I will happily show the clip, and a thing in Rowan can then chime in is this is the first clip we used, which is another part of the archive, makes extensive use of Lisa Dean's scrapbooks of photos from the period, which mm -hmm. Rowan scanned. Because it's one thing to tell the stories, but it's like there's a show and tell. When someone has an album out, that just invites people to, oh, yeah, right. And so I think you'll see both of those at work here. Let me um, go to share screen. And then let me call up the clip. And then hit share screen. And hopefully you'll yeah. all get the sound and this will work. Do we have a screen? Yep, yeah, you're good. All right, then we'll click play. And it runs uh, three minutes for those watching at home. Oh, it's sorry. I'm sorry. Wrong clip. <laughs> Wrong clip. <laughs> uh, you're right. I got it. No, it's right here. Um, there we go. You know, it really was a nice bar, and Steve Steve wanted it to be a bar, a restaurant, a place where everybody of all ages could come because our community, you know, starts at the 21 up to the elders, you know, so, you know, folks that are over 60, they don't always go out and drink anymore, so he thought, well, we'll do a, a nice restaurant with a Caribbean theme. And so when they opened up, we had like a 10 table area for the restaurant, beautiful bar, um, the dance floor, you know, if you were to go into what it is now, it is a uh, Sushiya, which is the sushi place. And you walk in the front door and you see the bar that is the actual bar that they, I think it was actually the actual bar that was there that they refurbished. And then around off to the side where they've got their, their dining room tables was where our dining room was. Um, I think they have a tep teppanyaki room. That would be the DJ area and the dance floor. So it was a very nice bar. They put a lot of money into it. I, and, and I don't know how much, but it had carpeting. The bathrooms were nice. It, it was upper scale. And... One of the things I remember from the few bars I'd gone to, like even in um, Santa Barbara, all of those places seemed to be in what I consider dark, dank places. You know, we're going into the seat of your district and, you know, it was a dive bar that was smelly, it was old, it'd been here for forever. And Breezes was beautiful. It was, to me, amazing. So, um... It was the highlight of um, 
of San Luis. I mean, the first, after Journey's End, the first of its kind, something that big, something open. And that was one of the things that really scared some folks is that, you know, we're in a strip mall. We're not hiding in the back where, you know, you've got to drive around the river under the bridge and then you park your car here and you walk two miles over here. You can park and you walk right in the, in the bar. And so that, um, that had a big impact on people. People were like, well, what if somebody sees me? What if somebody sees my car? What if, you know, what if we get harassed by the cops? You know, it was still scary, scary times for some folks who legitimately could lose their jobs. They could, you know, lose their families and friends. So that's that's a, a clip from the first uh, major interview that we we did. And Autumn, who is the student that worked on uh, one of the students that worked with us on the project, we have a, a number of students who uh, joined, and not just students from Cal Poly, but also students from Cuesta College too. Uh, it was a, interesting as a kind of community project in that way. Um, Autumn did the interview; uh, she wrote all the questions herself uh, and conducted it. Um, and so you don't hear Autumn asking the questions in that clip, but um, she's there. Um, and so this was, and there's a lot that we can say uh, about that clip, uh, about kind of the bar and, and all of that. Um, but that gives you kind of an idea of what our early work was um, doing. Um, and then it was the kind of springboard that allowed us to do the bigger project. Um, it's at that point we applied for um, a... California Humanities Quick Grant, uh, Humanities for All Quick Grant, um, which is a small, there's two levels of awards, the smaller award. Um, but we applied for that. And David was the one who, who kind of spearheaded putting that application together. Um, and um, we got a uh, grant award for about $5,000 to fund uh, doing, I think it was David, remind me, it was like 10 interviews, was it? It was 10 interviews. So it it did they didn't require it of the grant, but we, we got a five thousand dollar grant and then we leveraged it here in the community and raised five thousand dollars from individual donors as well. Right. And the deliverable was um 10 transcribed uploaded video interviews and a public event. Yeah. Which was made a little more difficult because of course COVID hit between that Lisa Dean interview. <laughs> and the um, completion of our project as well. And there was a period of time when it was questionable, you know, can you hold a public event? We did interviews where we wore masks and the person on the far side of, of the camera did not, or we tried outdoor interviews for a while until the band was rehearsing at Cuesta College of all the afternoons to do the jazz band rehearsal. Um, but so those were some of the things we had to also deal with COVID during this project um, as well. Yeah. And kind of what, what's interesting about some of those interviews where you can see or get a sense of how COVID shaped the interview process at that time. Um, the, you know, those oral history interviews are incredibly valuable for the stories that uh, our narrators, and when we're doing oral history, we refer to the, the folks that we're interviewing as narrators, but the, you know, they're, they're valuable for the stories that we're getting from the narrators um, and the, what they're able to, to tell us about the kind of history of, of San Luis Obispo. Um, but those videos are also really interesting as documents of like COVID times too, looking, uh, or th that, that particular moment in COVID time, because uh, we are still in COVID time. Um, uh, but it, yeah, and so anyway, we, we kind of did our, we completed the project over the span of a year, um, doing those interviews. Um, and the interview process is really kind of interesting of, of how we did it. Uh, and then completed the project in uh, 2021. The, the premiere event was December 15th of 2021 at the okay. museum. 
Yeah, in which we had the uh, displayed clips from uh, a number of different interviews, many of which we can you know show today to give you a sense of the range of the people we interviewed and the stories that we got. Um, and then a lot of the our interview our narrators came to that event and kind of hung out so they could kind of see what the finished product looked like too. Uh, and then we worked to kind of get everything uploaded and uh, onto the website. Um, and then, yeah. the finale, well, the finale of the December 15th event was what we learned from one of our interviews is not Breezes may have been the first openly queer bar in San Luis, but we learned from the guy, uh, Kelly Kuros, who had been a Cal Poly student in the 80s, and he was the first, second president of the um, Pride Club at, at uh, Cal Poly at the time, that the Howard Johnson's, which is now a restaurant called Taco Temple, which had been a place called Margie's Diners, was apparently on Thursday nights or whatever, the unofficial gay meetup place back in the 1980s. And that if you did live here, you knew that you went to the Howard Johnson's. And so we let the owners of the place know that we were coming back. They put aside the room in the back, which is adjacent to and had been that exact bar. And in fact, I remember uh, we all got there and Kelly's remark, we looked around and goes, wow, it's it's a lot brighter now than I remember it. Uh, on the other hand, maybe the dim lighting wasn't such a bad idea at the time after all. Um, and so uh, we did that. We uh, also, we might mention that when we celebrated after uh, the first national coming out day, after we'd done the Lisa Dean interview, again, with the cooperation of the owner of Breezes Today, which is a Japanese sushi restaurant. We invited Lisa as our guest of honor and lots of other people. And I think, oh gosh, that night, Rowan, you were there. Was there be like 48, 50 people? The oh, restaurant yeah. was At overwhelmed. Least. They were finding and pulling in chairs from anywhere. There had not been that many queer people in that restaurant since it closed in 1997. Yeah. Uh, Rowan, did you, was there something you wanted to add? I'm sorry, I think you got. Oh, still I just, I that was something that I remember being very struck by was how we uh, oftentimes when we were having these celebrations after an event or because of an event, we would have so much participation from our narrators, and it was almost like a I don't know, like a reunion where everybody really enjoyed it, and it, I don't know, it's just a community bonding thing. It really struck me as it wasn't just about the history; it's about community bonding too. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that you know we and one of the ways that we conceptualized the project when we were uh, kind of pitching it to California Humanities uh, was that you know San Luis Obispo is this. It's a and I don't know how familiar folks uh, are with it, but it's a small. It's a college town. It's a it's a kind of tourist town. Um, that's about halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco on the coast. Um, and, you know, California has a, this you know, reputation of being a haven for um, kind of queer and trans people. It's like if you are living in flyover country in the U.S., you know, pack your bags and get yourself to the coast kind of a thing. And this is actually... And in, in that this is this is a story. It's it, it it hides over a lot of complexity about what it's like to live in, um, uh, you know, what um, central parts of the United States, like what it's like to be queer living in the Midwest. Um, it also hides over a lot of the realities of what it's like to be queer or trans living in um, the West Coast. But the other thing it it does is it it tends to associate kind of queer life with major urban centers. So San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York City, Chicago. Um, and um, it, it um, makes it seem like even if you're living in a rural or semi-rural place in California, what you really got to do is you got to get yourself up to San Francisco or down to LA. And that's where you can build a life for yourself. Um, and so that, you know, there, there is something to that, but it also, I think, hides a lot of complexity about people's lives. Uh, and so we, we we structured the the project itself about how can we understand what it's like to live, to be queer and live in a place that maybe isn't recognized as being a kind of urban center. And, you know, what we what we saw and I think what we experienced in having people come out to events is that there actually is actually a kind of 
queer life here uh, and they're trans people living here and kind of living, um, building meaningful lives for themselves, it's just harder to see. And so the oral histories were a way of kind of bringing that out and being able to see that. Uh, it changed a, a lot of how I think of the city in the area. Um, and like, yeah, people do go up to San Francisco and LA, but they like coming back here. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I don't know if uh, uh, David or Rowan, you wanted to add to any of that? I'm, I'm wondering if a clip that might play to the rural nature would be uh, how Bart and Tony settled out in the countryside. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, now that we're talking about the, you know, here's here's a, a sophisticated, all right, urban sophisticates from San Francisco who end up homesteading on like a 700 acre ranch. So um, here, why don't I dig up this uh, this clip here? Oh, wait, at first I have to hit share screen. Got that. And then I click on that and then I click share and let's let's give this one a try. Let's... All I knew from the signing, and even from his family uh, at first, is that, uh, that he was a good old homesteader and single all his life. However, uh, I started wondering, and so I looked in some of the records, and I saw in the eight, uh, 1916 census that he was living here with another George. Our guy was George Rushart, and this other guy was George Hoxie. You'll see the log cabin a little later where George Rushart fir first lived, and then next door the milled wood house that he built. And uh, I didn't know anything about George Hoxie. And I really didn't until uh, his great niece, Gladys, who was in her 90s when she came along. As I told you, she was a real pit. Um, she, she brought her uh, son and daughter-in-law with her. Remember the, the couple that came with him? Because they drove. She's in the 90s and she didn't drive anymore. And uh, they, they were not, they were kind of antsy talking about George, but, but she said, oh, no, no question about it. He lived here with his partner, his, his spouse, uh, a good looking, somewhat younger man. <laughs> she thought it was great. So Gladys was a lot of fun. That's the kind of, the kind of woman I loved. And uh, yeah, they made it very clear. And subsequently, I, dis I discovered uh, in the Vacaville Cemetery that their graves are side by side. George with a family plot and George Hox, uh, George Rushard and George Hoxie right in the plot next door. Makes us uh, feel like we really belong here at this ranch. And it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, sometimes a difficult place, very hot and very cold, as the interior tends to be, and more so, much more so than the coast. But, uh, but as I say, it has its tremendous advantages and uh, I, I love the place. We go outdoors every day almost, uh, jogging or, or a plant, as you know, I'm planting acorns. I've got the set of acorns over there and I've already planted probably twice as many as you see there, maybe three times as many already for this year. And uh, we've got new trees popping up and it's great. Great, yeah. So I guess that goes to what you were saying, Stephen, about a rural urban conundrum that, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in media and otherwise on the urban queer life, but not necessarily as much on the, the rural existence. Yeah. And that's a it's an interesting clip to, um, you know, I think for a lot of, of different reasons, um, one of which is that, like, it, it really does showcase that sense of like, oh, like kind of queerness in kind of a rural space. And it's like tapping into a kind of complicated history because it's a, a history of settlement and uh, kind of westward expansion and colonization too, that you know, see the kind of queerness like mixed up with that. So it's a kind of complex, but it makes an interesting history, right? Is that there's a messiness to kind of history here, but it's something that kind of Bart and his partner, Tony, have been able to kind of connect to and um, the place. Uh, so it's, it was a, it's an interesting find. It was kind of cool to be able to see the cabin and, um, they're very kind of hospitable to us to kind of showcase that spaces. Um, um, another, another kind of important feature of the, the project is that it, um, you know, we were, we were really wanted to make sure that we had young people. So students, 
um, working with and interviewing um, part of the way we pitched the project too is that this is a project about interviewing our queer and trans elders um, because of, um, you know, making sure we've, you know, to be morbid about it, but getting their stories before they go. <laughs> um, and so uh, we wanted to, to then have that dynamic between younger folks being able to connect with older folks. Um, and I think it I think it helped the quality of the interviews tr tremendously. Um, I think we got a lot of really kind of cool stuff. And um, in order to to kind of facilitate those kinds of connections, right? And a lot of the narrators still ask after, right? It's like how is how is um, Autumn doing? Or one of our other interviewers was um, Dylan, uh, and how is you know asking after Dylan and things like that. Um, you know, um, Sari Dorkin sent me like she still sends me like Christmas cards <laughs> in the mail from her, 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 um, she has like a, a retirement community that she lives in with her wife and they send me and she wears her little Hanukkah sweater in the little Christmas cards. And it's just always so delightful. And I think we also got a Christmas card I shared from uh, Rick Tibben, who we interviewed as well. You know, I think, isn't it the end of the W H Auden Paul Auden W.H. Auden poem, Nightmare, who dast can ever believe themselves or wish to believe themselves forgotten. And I think a lot of these people that no one had ever, well, especially with the case of Peggy Jones. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Had asked their stories before. Yeah. 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 And Peggy, uh -huh. Peggy definitely has quite a story to tell. Should we share the three minutes of Peggy's story? Sure. Yeah, let's right to share that one. Let me make sure I click the right uh, button, and then okay, and then I, and then I go here, and then I uh, hang on, share screen, and there, and share, and. I saw my endocrinologist again, and he said, well, we'll put you back on testosterone. And at that point, I told him, I think I'd rather die than go back on testosterone again. And I said that off the cuff, without thinking about it, and even I was shocked by what I said, because I really didn't know why I said it. Here, you would rather die than take testosterone and be a man? So that was the beginning of my transition at that point, where I really realized, no, I didn't want to be a man. And, and when I look back on my life, I really didn't ever think I was one. I, all the things I did to hide it, all the things I did to make people think I was something I wasn't, because during my lifetime, most of this was a conscious effort. It wasn't something I suddenly realized when I was almost 50 years old. It was something I decided I'm tired of doing. I can't do it anymore. And to accept myself for who I am. Well, even at that point, I didn't really know who I was. Uh, I had some more tests done, and that's when I discovered that I was uh, Kleinsfelter, 47XXY, means I had two X chromosomes. Uh, that and the three sex chromosomes interfered with the uh, in utero development, so nothing ever completely developed as it should. Uh, you know, and at that point I decided I'm not going to live my life as a man. So I decided, well, I think I'll see if I can transition. It, 
it's I don't know if uh, Rowan would like Rowan did the interview and the research. And I, and I think this is a point that we all discussed before the interviews, which is it's not particular. It's OK. Technically or theoretically, it should be an objective experience. Right. Documentarians tend to be or think of themselves as objective. But sometimes the emotions can flow very difficultly and their trauma can become your your trauma. And I know I a lot of times for me, I was behind the camera. So that piece of glass really does act as a filter because I'm worried about making sure all that stuff and the dials and the gauges are right. But I don't know, Rowan, if you if you only if you'll care to share your experience on the other side of that. I I remember tearing up at Peggy's story. Um it was there was a lot to it that we uncovered and it was a very interesting perspective because of what we learned about um, like medical attitudes towards intersex people and from the actual perspective of the intersex trans, the intersex individual and having her experience of it kind of documented um, that meant a lot to me. And I just, I remember yeah, it was it was it was difficult, but I think very, very worth the the what what it was. Um, yeah, yeah. I remember that room was like so charged. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it yeah. was because it wasn't just it was it was that you know she had been basically forced into this identity for her entire life and she finally had that moment where she she realized that she didn't want that anymore what she thought she was supposed to be and that was a really really powerful story to capture one of those interviews after which there's nothing but continuing silence mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's nothing, nothing more that can be said yeah 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 um we have we have some questions uh yeah. I'm um uh i i and i i just to it's so nice for folks to ask questions um so lindsay asks is this project still ongoing and if yes is there a way to get involved um i think i think we're kind of indefinite we're like we you know we keep we're kind of in a um a, a dormant phase at the moment because we're all swamped with our day jobs <laughs> um, but I would like to do more, uh, and, um, how to, how to get involved. I'd say shoot us an email. We're not always so good about checking our email. <laughs> um, but if you're persistent, we will, we will try to figure out a way to get you involved. Mm. Yeah. At this phase, I feel like we're doing a lot of kind of community educating. Um, you know, sometimes we'll do a panel, like we did a panel for, um, the local pride festival and we, sometimes do those kinds of ed like educational events so there's still stuff that we're doing sometimes yeah and i think also um as we get pieces and bits more pictures to perhaps digitize and put up on the web extra bits that you know will will come in that can feed uh, into the project i think steve another thing to mention is we inherited some material too that we were not the first to attempt this, that the uh, Gala Center, that was the original Pride Center in San Luis, which now actually has the name, the Gala Pride and Diversity Center of San Luis Obispo. They had attempted a project like this in 2005 and 2006 using a much more antiquated system of, of videotapes. And um, their best efforts at the time, they the audio and the video quality vary greatly, but we, finally helped, they helped us, or we helped them locate those tapes. And because I happen to keep every kind of video deck made since 1976 in my uh, storage of ancient media, because this is a digital process, this is a problem. We extinct our modes of digital recording. And, you know, even some stuff that we have on, uh, on my 256 uh, chip uh, gigabyte flash drive, you know, I've gone to places and I've shown younger uh, students 
five inch floppy disks. And the idea being that if we don't continually migrate or move the data, it will be lost. And so someone has to keep all those old layers, probably someone who has those drives that still work in a computer to pick up those things that are lost. And this will become, for the IT professionals, this is gonna be an ongoing issue of, of concern. So luckily I had an old eight millimeter video deck that could play those tapes. And then we fixed the color and fixed the sound as best as we could and had them transcribed. So um, interestingly enough, only one person from those original interviews was still alive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that that speaks really to the importance of like continuing work like this, that it's not something that you can ever really put down because there's always going to be new historical sources that you can interview and you have to find them. Yeah. And it, I, I think that speaks to your question a little bit, uh, Jacqueline, about um, challenges trying to preserve and document um, um, so we, one of the things that we did with our project is um, we are, we're kind of an independent group. Like we have our, I have an affiliation with Cal Poly. Um, um, it was important for me, I think, to want to have the group be outside of Cal Poly, not be uh, working under Cal Poly. But we we established a relationship with the archivists there. Uh, and so they are serving as our repository. So we have our stuff up on our website, but Cal Poly Special Archives and Special Collections is serving as our base to put the materials because they have, they they specialize, they are archivists. I'm very thankful for them. And uh, we work with Laura Cervetti there, who's been amazing, and Jessica Holada. Um, they have the equipment there to do the kind of migrations that David's talking about, but also equipment that can read older forms of uh, information storage, so floppy disks and things like that. So being able to work with them has been crucial for having access to the ability to preserve things. And they just have access to resources that we don't, you know, it, like we had to kind of scrounge to get our grant uh, grants. Um, and Dave did a, a wonderful job going out and fundraising, uh, which I'm terrible at doing. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so having that partnership was crucial. Um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the big wave in kind of gay and lesbian LGBT plus uh, history projects were really in the 70s is when they kind of started. And so a lot of those folks are working independently outside of um, universities and they've kind of built themselves up. So the One Archives in Los Angeles, the Archives in Toronto, the Gay and Lesbian Historical Society in San Francisco, they kind of have their own pool resources. They've gotten big enough to do that. But it was important for us to have some kind of partnership with the university to, to do that. Um, uh, Steve, yeah. I see a question from Lucas Moore that reminds me of one of our first experiences together on this. I love that you involved the younger queer and trans people in the creation. What has been feedback to the project been like from a queer communities in the area, not directly a part of the project? It reminds me of that evening we spent with the queer crowd and the others in San Luis. Maybe you could recall sharing that. Yeah, so there's there's been a number of small kind of community groups that have have formed kind of little ragtag things. Um, <laughs> And one of them invited us over to their meeting where they, and so we, we screened some of their clips. And when they saw that, and it's younger people, it was people in their twenties. Um, and when they saw the clips, they were so deeply moved by the, the fact that there had been a bar and there was this, these, uh, you could hear the intake of breath as once, you know, they saw the photographs themselves. The photographs in particular were quite powerful for them. Um, we So we've got a lot of positive responses. We've had some, um, of our, our queer elders who are kind of like, well, why didn't you interview me? <laughs> it's like, we, we, you know, we tried to be representative. We tried to get a diverse sampling of people. We only had the the time and funding to do 10. Um, and so we tried to get uh, as much of a, a kind of cross section as we could. And part of it is sometimes we reach out to people that would get back to us. So it's like- We, uh, uh, it's too. funny, I, I see one further down Maria asks, have there been any interviews from Lompoc, Santa Maria, and Napomo? What would be interesting? Well, you, you bring up, we did have a Napomo interview. And maybe we could run that because it is a South County story of the Southern San Luis Obispo uh, County. Um, Rick Tibbon was a person we found because I think I had seen, he had written a very striking letter to the editor in the 
New Times, the alternative weekly paper in San Luis Obispo. Now I'm trying to remember the story, but it definitely had to do with a, it was an activist letter and it was it was an angry letter, as I recall. So I contacted the newspaper and said, can you tell him we'd like to speak to him? Because it was he had a history going back to L.A. in, in the day. Um, and so uh, we that would, I guess, be the furthest we traveled in the south part of the uh, of the county. And it happens to be, I think, one of the amusing stories. So it's not as dark as <laughs> as some of them. If you'd like, I can run the three minutes of, of that. Yeah, well, why not? No, it's, a, it's a good story. OK, Rick, Rick Tibbin. And uh, let's see if we can dig it up here. We'll do the Tibbin, Tibbin. There we go. And then I go to uh, share the screen. And that should be it. When the California AIDS ride came through, uh, I made over 10,000 chocolate chip cookies for those guys. And um, this was the original booth. And it was Ricky Valdez Memorial cookie booth. I made over 660 cookies in my double ovens. And there's a lot of people that didn't get some. And so many people were disappointed because I think there were 2,500 riders. I started um, with the Pismo Beach Business Improvement Group. And we were able to get uh, the old Marie calendars in Pismo Beach to loan us the bake shop at night. And so we would sit there all night long and we'd make 3,000 cookies for the, for, the, um, uh, for the AIDS ride as they came into Oceano Airport. They used, to, they used to stay there, they don't anymore. But um, a funny story is the one time all the cameras showed up, I don't know how they, learned about it, but all the TV stations had their cables running everywhere and they wanted to see me, you know, make some cookies. So I put in five pounds of butter into the big hopper, not really realizing somebody had already done that. And we ended up with um, double butter cookies, which were like <laughs> thin little nothings, right? But the, but the people, the writers loved them. Um, one year I had, um, I don't know where the pictures are, but I had the kids at the local Dana Elementary School make, um, make uh, um, posters for the, for the guys. And we put it up all on the fence on Oceano Airport. And it actually brought tears to the eyes of some of the riders because the little kids making those posters, it was just amazing. One of them I remember said, be like the Energizer Bunny, keep going and going and going. And uh, and they were just, it was great. I'm surprised the school let me do that. But, and one of the things I did, let's see if I can find it. Go oh, here. I uh, wanted to do a Burma shave sign one of the years. So this is what I did. I said, Bicycle, bicyclist who ride for health and pride, chocolate chip cookies await at Oceano Gate. <laughs> so, but unfortunately, some of those signs were torn down before, before most of the riders came in from some idiot. But um, at least I tried. <laughs> yeah, it's our, we that's about as far south as the county as we went, but we made it. We made it up pretty far. In, we actually made it into Monterey County with uh, Bart and Tony. Um, there's a question about um, you know, the use of the term narrator instead of subject. What else, was there anything else you did to help make sure the narrators felt empowered when telling their stories? Um, I think you know we we did a, try to do a couple different things. Um, one of which is we gave the uh, our uh, narrators, you know, were deeply involved in the process. Like they got the questions ahead of time and we asked them if you don't want us to ask any particular kind of question, we won't ask it. We we didn't approach them as, as like hard hitting investigative interviews. 
but a chance for a kind of connection between, um, I mean, in, in, uh, Rowan, you did that process. If you Mm -hmm. wanted to talk about what it was like working with Peggy to get that set up. Yeah. A lot of it, it was just about, and I just, I admire her so much, just everything that she's been through in her life and how strong she's been through all of it. And it was all, a lot of it was just about building that relationship between me and her. Like I already knew her. I knew of her from the things she was doing with trans um, uh, groups in San Luis Obispo County. And so I just, you know, I, I talked to her. I had, I even did, I, I called her up on the phone. I did a little pre-interview even where I asked her, you know, what kinds of stuff would you want me to ask questions about? And I formed my questions based on what you know, it seemed like she wanted to talk about. And a lot of the time, if you, if you spend that time building that relationship, it becomes very clear very quickly what things they do and do not want to talk about. And it's a lot of it is just, um, listening. Yeah. Just some other technical things too. We produce transcripts (laughs) for all of our interviews. Um, uh, and so we, you know, gave each of our narrators a chance to review their transcripts and they had the, the capacity to embargo things so they could say, we don't want this to appear in the interview or we, you know, or we, we, you know, we don't want this in the interview, but it's okay to release it after say we've died or, and so we we let them know that that was a possibility. I don't think anybody wanted anything embargoed in it, thankfully. Um, but it, that was about again giving them some control over, uh, you know, giving them control over the process. And we said even after we did the interviews and the transcripts, that if they didn't want us to make it to to publish it, we wouldn't do it. Um, and so, and I think like even if if somebody came up to me now and said, you know, we don't want it to be public, I would have no problem taking it down. Um, um, for them, but it doesn't seem to be the case. I think they're all pretty happy with what happened with how it went. I think, uh, as as uh, as Rowan said, I think also Dylan did this too. It's the pre-interview mm-hmm. with them. Although I I do caution when we do get on the set, right? And we and we um, film in their home, and we allow them to decorate too, right? What knickknacks? What things represent? what your life's about. What would you like to put on, on the shelf, right? As a little decorating instinct for setting the place and, and the setting is while you're busy setting up, don't start talking to them about the subject, right? Talk about the weather, talk about what you did last weekend, because a lot of times what will happen is if you get them engaged while you're preparing or setting up, then when you ask them the question, even if they don't say it out loud, it's like, I told you this already. And it's not as fresh as it would be the first time, the first time around. And I think there was a lot of that small talk being made in the hour it takes to light and get the microphones up. And, you know, um, someone asked the question about that. What advice would you give for this kind of a, of a project? And I think, um, you know, we were lucky in that we had a little more technology to make it work, to, to get rid of the background noises, to have, appropriate microphones above them or or below them and to have a lot of lights but sometimes as the old photographer saying goes what's the best camera to use the one you have with you Uh, that said there are rules for you know composition for not having a set that's so big that you lose sight of the person in it uh you know for people not realizing it's out of focus until it's too late um, because this, it's different now, right? With the, it used to be that you look through the camera. I, I still look through the camera, but now we have that screen that folds out in front of you. And so you're busy looking there, there, or at the, or you're talking and trying to communicate with the person, but you're not paying attention to the screen down here. And that's when things can wander out of focus and you don't notice it till you're done and then you kind of get upset with yourself i was even here i was looking there we go the classic uh composition right the rule of thirds there's the diagonal line the the greek model for composition and and what what engages an audience i i i've seen the thing where the person is 
way over here and they're talking to you over here. You say, well, what's going on here? I don't know. But if you're over here and I'm talking to you here, now this space is engaging, right? It's an active space rather than nothing because it's between my eyes and you, the, the person asking the question over here. And so if we fill this space with stuff that's illustrative of the person's life, now you have something that because an interview runs 90 minutes, you have something that doesn't get that boring that quickly. That's and I, I, I would also, um, we were also very fortunate to have David with us to, to do help us with a lot of like making it look beautiful, right? And that was a big part of it is making sure that the the interviews are visual, they are high on a, a lot of detail, um, and that they're they're done professionally. Um, I think um, if you don't have access to those resources, like use what you've got. Um, Phones, right, have amazing cameras on them. But, you know, people have been doing oral histories before there were kind of useful or portable kind of recording tech, like video recording technology. So audio recording, right, works too. Um, and so using whatever you can to, you know, get those stories down. Um, and then if you have the opportunity to do, right, the kind of amazing um, high quality visuals, right? Take that chance, that opportunity. Um, Getting good sound is important because they use automated transcripts now. And, uh, you know, our project spans the gap. <laughs> the first transcript was Michael's job to do as a college student. And you, you sit down and do 90 minutes of verbatim. I think he worked on that for months. Yeah. Now, of course, you you feed an automated transcript into one of the many services. You feed in a ninety minute interview, and you have the the, the you have it back in ninety minutes, and it could be anywhere from eighty to ninety five percent accurate. And you just have to edit it. But again, the accuracy depends on how clear the audio is going into the me uh, into the machine, and how free of distracting background noises it can it can be as well. Yeah. The, the transcription services are really nice, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but, you know, um, you can always do it. The, and, and I think there is something to be said from doing it uh, by hand because you, you really learn the transcript that way. Um, you get really familiar with it, um, but it's really nice having a, so <laughs> a lot of that work done for you too. <laughs> and, and what the transcript also does, of course, is when you begin to put them all together, if you decide that there's a particular subject area that you're interested in, remember, we're all discussing the same region here. What we had developed is you, the first interview brings up certain subjects. And so obviously, if it's Lisa Dean and she talks about breezes, we're going to ask the subsequent interviewees, what do you remember about breezes? Now, breezes becomes a category, a column in a multi-column spreadsheet of topics. When someone brings up uh, as happened, and we have stories about that, the, the, pro, the AIDS flag came to Cal Poly, was a very big deal for the San Luis community. So you ask multiple people in an attempt to kind of triangulate the, the whole story. Well, do you remember when the pride flag came to Cal Poly? And so we would have a number of different answers about that. There was in the early 90s, an attempt to get the San Luis City Council to have a vote on an equality or an anti-discrimination measure. And so we would ask a number of the people, do you remember that? And therefore we get different points of view and different perspectives on, on that story uh, as well. And so someone looking to put together a more comprehensive history could say, well, tell us about the politics and let's pull out those stories. Tell us about the social spaces and pull out and assemble a piece just with those. And that's, again, this is an open source archive. You can go to the web, and there are ways you can download the clips. It's it's open source. You want to put together a compilation that just looks at the queer spaces of slow. You could pull out just just those clips, or you could pull them out of the transcripts using the word search function and put your own paper together on those uh, on those particular subjects. Yeah, that was a particularly touching story. I don't know. We do we have do you have another room for another three minute clip? Well, I'm going to cut in for just a minute because we are at the top of the hour and I want to honor everyone's time. 
Um, if attendees want to stay, we can do one more clip and then do a, you know, maybe a, a quick five, let's say five minute wrap up. Um, we do want to make sure we share with you the link to um, a couple things, as well as if there's a, any final dying questions you want to ask. Uh, so, David, yeah, I would say play it and then we'll do our final wrap up. All right. If this is have to go. You can uh, listen to it uh, when we post it online. And what I guess about what about the thing about Carol Leslie in this clip is that um, she is the only person from the archived interviews from 2005 who was still alive. So this is the one link between the past and the present history. So uh, we can do that one for three minutes. Oh, the other good thing that we did is we raised money to bring the AIDS quilt for the first time. And we had it at Cal Poly and it was very expensive. The first time we brought it, it was $10,000 and um, nobody was going to pay for it. So we raised every single penny to bring it by having an auction at the Grange in, in Morro Bay. And um, I will share this with you because I think um, because I was so active, Barbara said, oh, Carol's out on her begging tour. So I, I, I begged a lot of stuff from the community. And um, so I was picked to unfold a portion of the quilt. And I don't know if any of you have ever unfolded the quilt or felt, the, but you have such, or I had such a visceral effect of feeling the energy of the one that created it and also the loss of the energy of the one who is no longer here. So that was, I think that was one of our more impressive endeavors and a contribution to the community. It was very Solomon. I, I still attribute the wonderfulness of the hospice movement because I believe that the hospice movement is gay and lesbians gift to the community because it wasn't there was no hospice movement prior to that and it was an outgrowth of gay and lesbian people caring for their brothers during this process i'll never forget at one meeting um we said well enough of this gay people and lesbian let's just all be gay and so we went through that transition um this was before the broader glabtq so um, anyway, it was very heartwarming. And we were at a meeting and the lights were dull. We were meditating at this out, Laguna Outreach. And one of the young men there, must have been two, 300 people, got up and said, I want to thank my lesbian sisters because he said, we couldn't have made it through this without you. And I'm haunted by the fact that if it's something that happened in the lesbian community, I'm haunted by the fact that we might not have been as supportive. So he, he was, it was a beautiful moment, very touching. So. Wow, so, so beautiful. Um, I, I just wanna say thank you. This was, I, I've, learn so much and I hope that somehow somewhere this will continue um, and for those that are interested or reach out to you all maybe we can all collectively come together and apply for another grant and expand the work um, but I just want to say thank you for sharing and I think engaging with us and really as a reminder to the students here and in, in how you want to get involved and if you have an interest in this do reach out uh kara shared the links thank you kara so you can contact um steven and the team directly and then we'll add them to on the blog uh, i'm going to turn it over kara if you have any final words and then if you want to wrap it up with the speakers 
I'm just really echoing Dr. V. Thank you again for just giving us your time to being able to share something that's so powerful and something that maybe a lot of us had not realized, you know, we needed um, having these voices of our elders um, being preserved and, and being shared with us is so important. And I, uh, I mean, just as everyone's echoing in the chat, it's it's beautiful, it's it's powerful, the work that you've done, the time that you've taken to be able to do this is just, it's unlike anything we've seen. And thank you, thank you so much. And we really do hope that this isn't, you know, not just the first and last time, but that we do get to see, you know, CCQAP continue to do interviews and really grow and, and expand even beyond um, Central California, just to capture as many voices and intersectional identities as possible. So I thank you again. Um, do any of you have any last words that you'd like to share with us before we head out? Just thank you for the opportunity for letting us, you know, share our work with you. Yeah, it's very nice. Thank you. And a, and a shout out to those of the project who weren't here tonight, uh, Professor mm -hmm. Zach McKiernan and our students, um, Elias Simmons and um, uh, Dylan Canterbury and Michael Morris. That's that. Last words, Rowan. Um, yeah, thank you for letting us present. And um, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. Everyone have a great evening. You too. Thanks, Thanks very much. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.